how this all started. When I started uh, going harp, when I helped uh, put up the uh, towers at the coma, it was put up with the idea we were doing it for an oil company. We were putting it up there for what they called tomography. And uh, we came back a year later, and it was occupied by the Navy and the Air Force. And we finished doing a tune-up on it uh, and putting in all the uh, uh, transmitting uh, antenna wires, the interlinking wires and everything for the antennas. After that, it became a test subject, occupied by the Air Force and the Navy. And that's when I started seeing things happen going wrong. Uh, understand, it was devised to be a tomography instrument, and it got uh, taken over by the military. And it basically worked as, uh, just like they do tomography today, they bring the earth uh, the ground with uh, explosives now, and they look for a resounding of what reflects back from those soundings. The same thing goes with radio signals. They introduce a radio signal into the ground, and it shakes the ground, and they get a return off uh, the reflections, and they can tell what was underneath there. What they found out was it started interfering with the ionosphere. And when they found that out, it became a, an experiment. And it's been an experiment for a multitude of weaponry ever since. It is endless, the capabilities of what HARP is. It is an experiment in the process. It is endless, I say endless, what HARP can do. The understanding is just a minute fix at this time. They have they have only scratched the surface of what HARP is capable of. So, Bill, let me ask you a question. Why are they using HARP, and what was the reason initially? Not not to say uh, when I say when I say that they they started building it, but now that they have understood what they what the working with. What are they using it for? All 24 stations. Oh, it's more than 24 stations. It's 244 stations now. So what is what is the, the reason for HARP? I mean, the primary reason. I, I know it has multiple facets, but and we could, we could link it to all kinds of things like chemtrails, etc. I don't want to go to chemtrails right now. I want to say, why are they changing the weather patterns around the world? What's the major reason that you think? The first thing was they were trying to make a, it came, when Reagan came into being, he, uh, he wanted, oh, what's Star Wars? He started the Star Wars program. And that is when the emphasis was put on harp. That's when they was really booted up to high power. Go on. I'm trying to read some of these uh, things here. I'm not very good at this. I have to remember, my mind is kind of fading on me because of all the uh, uh, the things that have happened to me. Uh, I'm not all here. Yeah, don't look at the chat. Just let's talk in, on the mic. Okay. Well, you, you just ask me, and I'll, I'll try to stick with you. All right, so now, so the, the major reason that, that they developed HARP, go ahead and tell the history. To search for minerals and, and components for buying and uh, oil and so forth. They found out it was capable of blocking and destroying satellites. And they went from there. Uh, Reagan submitted recognition for Star Wars, and that's where the whole thing became an emphasis of a weapon. And now that weapon that they were looking for, they found out they could maneuver weather, they could 
create hurricanes. They could uh, shake the ground. They could uh, initialize earthquakes. It was a multitude of, of things they were finding out. And it's still in the process of being an experiment. Okay, so now we have to talk about, you know, you're talking about HARP being able to go into the ionosphere. Now, what happens when HARP pushes a hemoglobin up into the, uh, the ionosphere? What, what happens to the stratosphere? Doesn't the stratosphere have to, you know, kind of like compensate? As the ionosphere rises up, the anosphere comes up underneath it and makes a hole, like a donut, underneath the ionosphere. It's like a, like a balloon. If you push a balloon or pull a, a point in a balloon and there's visible air inside, you can see it make a, uh, a donut on the inside of that balloon. Same thing happens with the ionosphere and the stratosphere. So some people are talking about you know, I, my limited understanding, you know, I, I call it a hematobin, right? Like a, like a hematobin, like you would have, you know, in your chest if someone stabbed you, right? A hematobin, a bubble that would build in that area. Like a bruise. So then, let's talk about how that turns into reverberation. Does that, it, because, because that happens, then we're looking at something that comes back on the earth, doesn't it? I mean, isn't there a re reverberation that happens because of that? Uh, yes. Uh, there's a plasmatic effect as HARP, the high power of HARP, hits the ionosphere. It has a plasmatic effect. And in doing that so, it becomes like an amplifier. You're looking at a huge electronic amplifier in the ionosphere. It not only reflects the heart signals, but it amplifies it. It becomes like a large vacuum tube, electron vacuum tube, and it acts as an amplifier. So not only does it reflect the signal, it amplifies the main signal. Along the way, they can introduce other frequencies on that same heart frequency. And when that heart frequency reaches the ground, should those other frequencies be in tune and in phase where it hits the ground or whatever object they're trying to hit, uh, but if it's a grassy area, it creates a new energy. Almost, almost kind of mimicking planetary rhythmic pulse. What happens with the, with the moon, the moon, uh, you know, affecting the Earth. In, in, in kind of a way, right? Correct. When the moon is at a specific distance from the Earth, it reaches a what they call harmonic rhythmic point. And it's able to sustain just like a, a, an antenna, like a tuned antenna. When you reach a resonant point of an antenna, it develops energy of uh, that specific frequency that's hitting it. Same thing goes for rhythmic uh, distance. Okay, so now what we have to talk about is some of these earthquakes. I know this is a rabbit hole, but do you believe that HARP has been used to not, not I'm not saying create, but to identify certain areas with potential energy that they could actually use those areas and cause seismic activity? Absolutely. The primary frequency of HARP is 1.2 hertz. You figure that out to be the resonant length of a quarter wave is multiples of 7,282 feet. That is the the resonant uh, length and any multiple of that, uh, but the quarter wave length is 7,282 feet. You have oil wells that have uh, 
metal stems in the ground, 7,282 feet. You have railroads that are sectioned off every 7,282 feet. You have all these windmills that are these windmill farms from front, the very first windmill to the very last windmill is always 7,282 feet on their ground loop. All these are resident to those that primary frequency. Sir, so that, that could be the reason why they put that, that seismic monitor on HARP, even though HARP officially has nothing to do with, uh, with seismic activity. It's real. It's there. And all the sites are there. You can go to uh, any state in the United States, and there is a HARP station of one sort or another there. Because a lot of people on YouTube are saying, you know, soundbite researchers and all this, uh, you know, crap tag. They're saying that HARP has, they're looking at one particular, you know, HARP station. And they're saying, oh, well, man, it's all crap tag. I mean, are you saying to me that HARP is actually, you know, changing our weather patterns and also protecting us in some way? Ah, that's, that is the cure they thought in the beginning. They thought they could devise a bubble, a plasmatic bubble, to give us protection uh, from, well, for one thing, from the, uh, the sun's rays, uh, which is, it's, it, that's where the um, chemtrails came into being. Chemtrails work with harm, just as well as uh, windmills. These windmill farms, they're a tool that works with heart uh, in more than one way. Uh, let me exemplify something. Windmills spinning at a specific frequency. If you notice, they all now, in the beginning, uh, the windmills did not rotate at the same speed. One windmill would rotate at one speed, another one at another speed. As those windmills now spin in sync with each other, not only do they spin at a certain rate, but as they move through the air, the fiberglass rays make up a static charge above that area. That area is going to be at a resonant length of 7,282 feet. That cloud that's being resonated above is going to be a tune antenna at that length of static electricity. You fire a radar signal through that area of that cloud, and guess what you have? Go ahead and say it. But then let's let's, let's move off of the chemtrails because let's, I, I, we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Well, what you have there is a resonant antenna, a resonant antenna. And so, same goes with oil wells. Everybody's making all this noise about fracking. It isn't just fracking. It is the oil well stem, the pipe that goes down. Every oil well that goes in has an isolator at 7,282 feet below the ground. A resonant antenna. That's resonant. R E S A N T resonant for sure. So, so this fracking stuff is, is that just uh, the government psyop thing? You know, this whole fracking crap. No, it's, it it was done. Fracking itself is not the problem. It's all these oil wells. It isn't just the fracking. Fracking is where they're trying to get the last little bit out of uh, wells that have uh, more or less died, there, there's hardly anything left in them. They put acid and uh, minerals down there to break up what's left in this shell rock and try to raise that to the surface. Those are what they call dead wells. That's what fracking's about. All the wells have pipe down, metal pipe, that are tuned to the resonant frequency of harp.